What this basically says in a nutshell is that if I just let any system just evolve or just continue doing what it's, its thing without any outside stimulus, as time goes on, all systems in the real world tend to, to have greater disorder over time. And let me show you what I mean by that. If I have a box here, like this, and I divide it in half. So I have a, like a cork, like a stopper in the middle. And on the left-hand side, I have a gas, which fills the whole container. So this is a gas. So it's at some temperature or whatever. I don't have any flame or anything. I just have a gas there. And then what happens is I go and I have another state after I remove that cork. What do you think is going to happen? So here I have this. Here all of the gas is on one side. Then I pop that thing out. What's going to happen? You all know intuitively what's going to happen is, yeah, the gas will be over here, but it will spread to completely and totally fill the other side of this container. And it's going to do that it's not really by magic, it's because of the gas collisions happening, all the atoms bouncing off of each other, but you know that over time, maybe it takes one minute, maybe it takes 10 minutes, but it's going to spontaneously expand to fill that larger volume. And the reason it does that, or I shouldn't say the reason, but an observation is that this system has greater disorder. In other words, there are more places for the gas to be because it's a bigger space. So gas can be here, gas can be there, gas can be here, and they can all be moving at different speeds. This, this side has greater disorder. This side has less disorder. So what we say in physics is we say this has low entropy. And we use the letter S to talk about entropy. And this has high entropy or higher entropy. S. So any system, if you just leave it alone, it's going to go from low, en low entropy to high entropy. And the way we talk about that mathematically is delta S, I'll talk about that in a second, is going to be greater than or equal to zero. What this means, in, 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 I'm not going to break it all out here for you because we're going to get into a whole lesson here, but delta S means how does S change when we go delta, this triangle means change. It means, literally that's what it means, it means change. So how does this thing change? from S1 to S2. So it's like subtracting the S's, and what you're going to find is that this S is going to be bigger than this one. So when you subtract them, the, the change, the delta, S2 minus S1, is going to be greater than or equal to zero, which just means that this S is bigger than this one. Now it means that it could potentially be zero, but in real life it always increases. This one has higher entropy, higher S. This one has lower, so when you take high minus low, you get a number bigger than zero. That is true for every system that we've observed in our universe. It has a fundamental thing about our universe that entropy disorder increases over time as time goes on. If you take a cup of coffee, and black coffee, and you put a little bit of milk, like a few drops of, or you know, maybe a teaspoon of milk right in there, or creamer, right? In the beginning, the creamer might gently be kind of right where you dropped it. But if you just watch it, it's going to, over time, by itself, kind of disperse throughout the coffee so that it's evenly mixed throughout the coffee. So we say that the creamer in the beginning has low disorder, low entropy, but as time goes on, it gets to higher and higher entropy because the cream is spread out all over the place. There's more disorder all throughout that coffee. I'm not going to go too deep into this because we're going to have many, many d discussions about this. But the first law of thermodynamics basically says you can't. You can't get more work out of a system, W, than you put in as heat, Q. What it basically means is you can take some mechanism, any mechanism you want, add heat to the system, and you'll get work out but you will never get more work out than you put in. And that's basically why perpetual energy machines are impossible. No one's ever invented one. It is impossible in the universe that we live in to get energy or heat or work out of a system that is actually more than what we start off with. Whether it's chemical energy, whether it's solar energy, whether it's energy from a candle, whether it's nuclear energy, whether it's any kind of energy we have any experience with, whatever you put in, you're gonna have some losses here because see the, the piston in real life has friction, you're gonna have real losses, so you're never gonna get exactly the same amount of work out as you put in. 
you're going to get slightly less, but you will never ever get more workout. And that's, that's the first law of thermodynamics. That's why it's so simple to state it, but it's so complicated to, um, well, I shouldn't say complicated, but the problems can, can seem challenging, even though the concept is simple. And can we get the system to do any work for us? We want to build things, right? We want to make a system like an engine or something do something for us. So we want to calculate how to make it do work for us. Well, it turns out that matter, like think of a gas, right? Matter it consists of atoms moving around in a gas, right? That matter can contain energy, right? We talked about energy before. That was motion. Things moving have energy. Well, it turns out these gas molecules are moving everywhere. So there's tons of energy inside of a, of a collection of gas particles, right? We measure this energy as temperature, right? So we're gonna, that's kind of the first thing we talk about. We talk about temperature of, for instance, a gas being the average kinetic energy, which is, remember, that energy of motion. I haven't given you any equations yet, but it's the average value of the kinetic energy of the gas molecules. So there's a lot of energy in, in uh, a gas. And it turns out if I add heat to a gas, like a flame or something, then I'm going to increase the motion of those particles. And since the motion is the energy, then I've increased the temperature, which I can measure with a thermometer. So you all know this. This is simple stuff. If I add a, put a flame under water or a gas, its temperature is going to increase because the motion of the atoms is increased. And that's what the thermometer actually measures, is the average value of that. All right. So what we really want to do when we talk about thermodynamics is we want to figure out if we can get any of the any of this uh, heat energy to be converted into work. So typically what we're going to start by doing is we're going to look at a piston. You can think of a car piston, but really now I want you to think more of like a like a steam engine kind of thing. So if I have a piston inside of a chamber down here, very low to the bottom part here, and now outside the other side of the piston is like the rod. It kind of sticks up through here. And inside of this little area between the piston is a gas. So this is a gas. And right now the gas is kind of smushed right there, but it's a gas. It has a certain temperature and has a certain, you know, uh, yeah, has a certain temperature and a certain volume there, right? But what do you think is going to happen? And I know that you know the answer. What do you think is going to happen if I take this gas and I add heat to it? In other words, add heat, which we actually call Q in physics, heat. Uh, you can look up the historical reasons why we call it Q. But anyway, we, uh, we call it Q, which means adding heat energy. What's going to happen? So you can kind of think of like a little candle being under here with like a little flame or something under it. It's heating it up. What's going to happen? Well, the gas is going to get hotter and hotter and hotter, which means it's moving more and more. The gas particles are moving, and they're going to expand that piston. So the piston's not going to be that low anymore. The piston might rise, and the piston might then be pushed up like this, right? And so this is going to be a larger volume of the same gas. I haven't added any gas. The gas is there. I'm just making it get bigger by adding energy to it. But notice what happens. Whenever I push the piston, this thing moves up. So we say that this is done work. It does, whoops, does work. W. Because I can connect this piston to anything. I can connect it to a railroad, you know, a train, uh, uh, you know, wheel at the side of a train, or I can connect it to an axle to get it to turn something to get a car to move. Inside of a jet engine, there is differently designed. It's not a piston like this, but it's the same kind of thing. I'm changing the chemical energy of the fuel into a spinning motion in a turbine, and I'm pushing it out of the back of the engine, and I'm creating thrust. So I'm generating work from basically heat energy, or in the case of a jet engine, chemical energy. But it's the same sort of thing. You're taking energy in and you're turning it into work coming out. Work is basically energy of motion, of something doing something on the environment. All right? So this looks like you're getting something for nothing, right? Like, oh, I'm doing work. It's great. But you're really not because I have to come up with a, some place to get this heat from. In this case, I put a candle here. So I have the energies coming from the candle wax and combusting with the oxygen. Or in the jet engine, it's the jet fuel combusting with the oxygen. Or in a rocket engine, it's the hydrogen combusting with the oxygen, rocket fuel, right? So I'm getting the energy from matter, and then I'm turning it into some sort of useful work. And then the last main topic that we have in physics two is we talk about the concept of waves in general, waves. Now, you all have a pretty good understanding of waves, I think, because you've been to the beach before. So we say that we have this idea of a wave. You've seen it before. You've seen water waves come to you. Um, 
And so you, you have an intuitive understanding that there's an oscillation here, right? There's an oscillation. It's up and down, up and down. This is an oscillation, up and down. But you also know that the wave is carrying energy because you stand in the ocean, the wave hits you and it can knock you over. So it's carrying energy from the deep ocean into the beach and it's knocking you over. So the wave can carry energy and it can, it can transmit energy in that direction. So you can also see this with a rope, right? If I take a rope and I tie it to the wall or I get my friend to hold it and I've got, my, I got the other end, I can start oscillating it up and down and it's gonna start to propagate along the, the rope and it's gonna hit my friend's hand and if I shake it hard enough, his hand's gonna start wiggling because I'm taking energy from my hand, transmitting it through a wave, hitting my friend. And so I can use this kind of wave to transmit energy. But there's another kind of wave called a sound wave, which is slightly different, but the same idea. There's air between me and you. And that air, when my vocal cords vibrate, that air is vibrated. And it's basically shaking and it's oscillating. It's a little different than this one. A sound wave is like if you kind of think of a column of air between me and you. If you just think of like a little column then what's gonna happen when I talk, essentially, is, is there's gonna be a high concentration, a high pressure of atoms, and then less here, and then there'll be another high concentration over here, and then maybe less over here, and then the process will repeat itself. So this is called a compression wave, where when I talk, I'm literally moving back and forth, and I'm compressing the air right in front of my mouth, and that tra go, travels forward towards you and carries energy with it. And so if you could slice the air and look at it in cross-section, you would see these high pressure regions of air. That's where I've compressed the air and then I've had these lower pressure regions in the middle. And, but this whole thing, this, these, these little regions are moving and they're carrying energy. It's called a compression wave. This is actually called a transverse wave. We're gonna talk a lot about that. But you have a whole lot of topics with sound waves uh, in terms of Doppler shifting and frequency and amplitude and all that stuff we're going to talk about. So now we've basically talked about general concepts of physics one and physics two. And next we're going to talk about the concepts associated with physics three. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.